Hi, I'm Gareth Marlowe and I want to talk today about culture failure and Zoom. So Zoom is a very popular video conferencing software product uh, and it's been very popular because it's very easy to use and it's very high quality. Um, but they've got a problem. Uh, and the problem is that in the interest of making the software easy to use, they've made some changes to the way that it works on a Mac. Uh, and the problem that they were trying to solve is how can we start a video conferencing session in as few clicks as possible? And on a Mac, just the way that the Macs work, um, they ended up needing to have two clicks to start a video conferencing session. So how do we solve that problem? So somebody figured out that, okay, we can do something with the technology in such a way that we can start a video conferencing session with just one click. Happy days. Except there's a problem. And the problem is that what they ended up deploying was bad software. Uh, the software, the way it was structured, the way it was designed, uh, wasn't very good, it wasn't very secure. And one of the consequences of this um, was that they kind of expe exceeded what they were trying to do. So they made it possible to start a video conferencing session with zero clicks just by visiting uh, an appropriately configured website. Now when you think about the consequences of what that means, I can entice you to visit a website and just by the act of visiting that website I can start a video conferencing session and there you are live in the session. Potentially very, very serious consequences to that. You know, there's a heck of a difference between one click and zero clicks. Zero clicks is a really big problem. Now what I'm really interested in is the culture failure or the breakdown of culture that kind of allowed this to happen. So the first thing to look at is like what has their reaction been? And the reaction has been very defensive. So they've tried to say, look, it's supposed to work like that. This is a feature, not a bug. Um, there's no problem because if a video conferencing session starts, then a window pops up and it's obvious that you're in a video conferencing session. And the problem is that they're kind of making excuses. They're making excuses to justify what they've done. And like a kid sort of complaining that they haven't actually done anything wrong and becoming up with more and more outlandish reasons and justifications that make themselves look sort of more and more stupid. And this really is a problem if you're a video conferencing software company because essentially you want the trust of your users. What the, your, the contract really between you and the users says, um, okay, I will let you have access to the camera and the microphone on my laptop, but I need to trust that you're gonna use it sensibly. Uh, and they've kind of broken that trust. And not only have they broken that trust, instead of sort of putting their hands up and owning it and then doing something about it, they've attempted to justify it, which is sort of making the problem worse. So that's kind of one culture problem that we've got here, is this sort of defensive justification response rather than just hands up and admitting the problem and uh, admitting that they need to do something about it. But the other thing that I'm interested in is... Um, how did they get out in the first place? What were the series of decisions that took place within the company that made them think, yeah, this is a sensible thing to do? Um, you know, how come nobody said no? So there's three possible explanations, I think. So the first is that you've got a sort of lone agent. You've got a renegade person who's kind of thought that this is a good idea and they've made the changes to the software and they've shipped the changes to the software and they've ended up on... Uh, people's desks, desktop computers and laptop computers and, and just nobody else in the organisation is aware. I, I, I just don't buy this, okay? It typically takes at least tens of people to write software, test it, get it out to the field and get it into the hands of users. A um, number of different people in different roles and different functions, I refuse to, I sort of refuse to believe that this is even possible for a lone agent. Um, Okay, the second possible thing could be that nobody actually saw the problem. Nobody actually realised that this was going to be a problem before it was discovered out in the wild. And again, it's like, really? Really? There's nobody there who kind of thought, oh, are there any downsides to this? Should we, we maybe not do that? Um, if it is the case that nobody in the organisation actually was able to see this and understand this and, and do something to stop it, then I would sort of say, well, what, what's going on with the diversity of your teams? Um, why have you not got diverse enough groups of people working on your software such so that at least somebody is coming at this from the perspective of, uh, you know, 
are there likely to be any problems with this? Are there likely to be any downsides? So if it's, if it's really the case that nobody spotted this in the first place, then, you know, that feels to me like a diversity problem. Or the third possible explanation is people did see it, people did spot it, people spoke up and they were overruled, okay, or they were ignored. Um, this is really interesting, okay, so what's going on there? Is there a culture of, um, uh, a culture of lack of challenge that, 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 um, that challenge is not encouraged or if challenge happens it's, it's downplayed or it's overturned? Um, Either way, I think where Zoom have ended up is not in a very good place. And all right, there are specific fixes that they can do to this problem and they can, they can rewrite and they can deploy new versions of the software that kind of solves the problem. But I, you know, when I heard about what was going on, I deleted Zoom off my Mac. And to be honest, I'm not sure that um, simply patching the software or fixing the software and putting out a new version of it is sufficient because I kind of think the trust has been broken and in order to regain trust or to rebuild that trust then what needs to happen at Zoom is that they need to fix the problem at the root cause so it's not just okay we will you know we will reverse what we've done in this software but you kind of need to fix your organization because if your organization is capable of has been capable of doing this then you know you can put an elastoplast over the solution that you got come up with but but really it's not going to prevent something like this from happening again and if I'm going to put your software back on my computer and allow you to have control of my microphone and my camera I've got to be a lot more confident that you have done what's necessary to make sure that this problem doesn't occur again okay so takeaways from the zoom situation checks and balances if that was a lone wolf how did that happen and why were the right checks and balances not in place um, Diversity of your team, have you got a wide enough team working on this problem? And finally, do you have a culture of challenge? Because if you don't, how am I going to trust you? Okay, I'm Gareth. Thanks for listening. See you next time.